chapter 53 and Romans. Romans, we're going to spend most of the time in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 in your Bible and Isaiah chapter 53. And if you'll find those two. And while you're looking there, uh, I just wanted to mention um, this next Saturday, we barring rain or snow or a hurricane or whatever, uh, we're having a, a, a church work day. Uh, we have a spring and fall clean up, paint up, touch up. And if you just wanted to come down with a weed eater Saturday and you say, what can I chop? Just anything. Uh, if it's blooming, don't chop it. Okay. How's that? But, um, we could inside touch up paint work, vacuuming, cleaning windows, sills, you name it. Uh, from just, we're just going to say from noon on, and uh, well, people out soul winning in the morning on bus routes, it won't be back at noon. But if you'd like to join us and just come help, and if you know you want to do something, you want to bring your own supplies so you know you have Windex and you have whatever, uh, bring your own, that's fine. But there's, there's lots to do on 16 acres. And you could be a blessing, and that would be good. And I didn't during visitors. Roger and Mary Ann come here a lot. And so I just want to mention they are visitors, but they're here so much. Um, they've come off enough now that 2% of their tithe should be, should be here. They live over in Arizona, but thank you, Roger. And your lovely daughter as well. But anyway, just I, I felt bad I didn't mention them. If you come here often enough, we'll just ignore you. <laughs> That's really terrible, isn't it? But anyway, so let's look at, look at the Bible. We don't have enough time for it. Let's stand for a moment, Isaiah, or Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, and then we'll get over to Isaiah 53. If you've never read a Bible, don't know anything about the Bible, uh, today I'm going to be some very simple things that uh, I can assure you uh, you should be able to follow, and hopefully it'll be a help to you, the youngest Christian to the oldest and uh, we'll, we'll brush across some doctrinal things that will help everybody. So look at Romans chapter 4, and then look down at verse 4. And this is very familiar to some of you. We're going to start a very familiar territory. Isaiah, uh, Romans 4, 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And we'll read some more in a moment, but let's pray. Father, would you speak to our hearts today? Help us from the newest teenager just to come along, maybe riding on a bus or with their family, or to our folks who've been here for decades. We ask you to teach us and help us and that your Holy Spirit would work here. We want you here. We want your blessing. We want to be useful to you and honor you. We want our homes to be helped. We've got some young folks uh, planning marriages, and, and we want them to build their future on you and, and that you would help them in this world that's such a mess. So help us today and teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, hold your Bible open there in Romans chapter 4. And uh, this today is, uh, like I said, a familiar starting point. But um, I love to tell the story. For those who know it best, seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And don't ever lose the wonder of the simplicity of the gospel. And so just starting out, uh, you notice this, there's some key words I want you to notice. In verse 4, now to him, now he's talking about salvation and, and how you can find yourself righteous, not in the eyes of men, because that's too shallow, but righteous in the eyes of God. And that's key, could be, because if you're going to go to heaven, you have to be righteous before God, which none of us are righteous in our own. And you'll see that in a moment. And uh, if you know some Bible, don't, don't cut me off yet. I'm getting there. And uh, uh, I've already argued all the arguments that you could argue, and we could together agree. But uh, we're gonna, I'm just taking the slow boat, okay? So give me a chance to get there. So Romans 4, 4, now to him... There's that first word I want you to notice. To him that what? Worketh. This is a guy who works to be righteous and works to be good and works to be what he's supposed to be. Uh, works to be religious. Works to be the good neighbor. Works to do all the good. He, he comes over and washes the pastor's car. That'd be all right. Uh, to him that work, better yet, wash the pastor's wife's car. That's really good. Now to him that worketh 
is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of what? Debt. Now, grace is something God gives you that you don't deserve. That's the word grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is, the Bible says we're saved by grace. Hey, guys, you don't have to be here. But if you're here, you do have to be quiet. Okay? I uh, love you. Glad you're here. But you're not going to disrupt church. You can slip out anytime you want. Um, the, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of what? Debt. Debt. All right. So I need a worker guy up here. Benny, you look like a working man. Come on up here. All right. So we're going to put Benny to work. You just stand right here somewhere where you won't fall down. And I was supposed to bring this giant sign from home and I left it at home. So this is the best that I know how to print on our printer. And if you can't read that in the back, sit toward the front. It says work. All right. So now to him that worketh, this is the good guy, honors his mother and father, and, and he doesn't shoplift, and he, he doesn't eat thirds on ice cream, and he's good, all right? To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of what? So what is this guy? He's a debtor. He's a debtor, all right? And I'm, we're, I'm just quoting the verse we're just reading there, uh, verse Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, so to him that worketh, this guy's working, he's going to church, he's doing all the religious do's and don'ts, and he, you know, kisses the pastor's ring, and don't do that. What a disgusting thing. Leave my ring alone. Um, he, uh, he, he's working all the religious duties. He's working as a religious guy, a good guy, and the reward is that he is a what? debtor according to that scripture to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt all right very simple we're not going to spend a lot of time on it verse five but to him that worketh not so here's a guy he's not trying to be religious he's not trying to be the get best guy on the block to him that worketh not but what's that next word believe it so i need a not worker joseph joseph is the non-working person I, mean, I want to stand by, by Benny uh, over here. You are the work not. Don't let your mom find out. She'll beat you. Uh, this guy, he's not trusting his good deed. Now, that doesn't mean he's not good, but he's not trusting his goodness. It's a big difference. Um, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So the guy who's trying to work his way to heaven ends up being a debtor but to him that worketh not but that next word is the key but what can you hold two pieces of paper at once joseph this is hard um to him that worketh not let's reverse them there we go my my ocd oh that's funny <laughs> no od o, odc uh, ac ad uh, anyway add <laughs> To him that worketh not, but what? Believeth. Look there at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? Righteous. So this guy, he puts his faith in Jesus Christ, and he is counted, not that he is righteous, but he's counted as what? Righteous. And this guy who is doing his very best to work and be religious. He's doing everything, the person, the religious, whoever, whatever church you go. He, one guy came here one day, we were talking, and I asked him about his salvation. He said, look, I was baptized in the Mormon church and the Catholic church and the Baptist church. He said, I got all the bases covered. <laughs> said, Man, we better get the faith and not works here, my friend. So to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Who justifies the ungodly? Jesus did. God did. Jesus did when he died on the cross. He justified the ungodly. The word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. We're, we're not sinless, but thanks to Christ's death, he takes our sin, puts it on the cross, and he takes his righteousness, puts it on us. And so if you look at that last verse there, these guys' arms are going to fall, fall off holding here. In the end of verse 5, 
his, look at the very end of verse 5, his faith is counted for righteousness. You ever get a wrong answer in school and you ask the teacher, isn't that close? Then they say, we will count that, said Mr. Beal, never. Uh, no, not really. Brother Trent, do you do that? No, not, not, not when Mr. Beal, the principal's in the room. <laughs> Trent's one of our teachers as well. Um, so we call it, you say, I'll count that. It's, it's not what I was looking for. In my class today, we had trivia. Uh, who was the prophet that was ordained a prophet from the womb? And someone said John the Baptist. And then Brother Cooper, he does our fun stuff. He said, no, no, Old Testament. They said, well, you didn't say Old Testament. And just so you know, I can't remember who said that, but I don't know that, uh, never mind, I'm not going to get into that. I'm not sure John the Baptist was ever called a prophet, but maybe he was. But anyway, the answer was, was Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1. God said, I ordained you a prophet from the womb, but we counted John the Baptist because he was from birth. He was called of God. And so we count it. It's not the answer we had. But you know what? Though Joseph has fallen short of God's righteousness, when he doesn't trust his works, but he believes and puts his faith in Jesus Christ, God says, I'll count your faith as if it were righteousness. So God sees this. Now, if I was smart, I would take this and turn it around and it, pretend it says righteousness there. He says he'll count your faith as righteousness and so joseph doesn't have to try to be good enough to get to heaven he just keeps his faith in jesus christ and god says i'll count that that's good enough for me and he looks at benny and says you're in a world of hurt all right thank you you can go sit down guys so what we have we have two types of people there are those who are working and they're they're trusting their own righteousness and God says you're a debtor and then there are those who are not trying to earn their way to heaven but they're simply believing that what Jesus did on the cross is good to save them and God says I will count that for righteousness so the first thing this morning I want us to notice is that salvation has nothing to do with how good we are Salvation has to do with how good he is. There's no one in here who can be good enough to make God satisfied with our personal righteousness. There's no one here that's good enough that God says, you've earned heaven by being so very good. Because we're not that good. And you take the best person in this room, and probably no one in the room knows who that is, because if you're the best person in the room, you don't think you're the best person. But the best person in this room is still a sinner. And we can look at a lot of that in the prior chapter. So number one this morning, I want us to notice that there are those who are trying to work their way to heaven. I'm religious. I was baptized. I was confirmed. I joined the Baptist church. I was baptized Mormon, Lutheran, Catholic, and Presbyterian, and Baptist. Do they baptize Muslims? I don't know. Uh, you can do all the religious deeds you want and God says you're a what's the last word a debtor you're a debtor because that won't take the Bible doesn't say the way you pay for your sin is by being good look back just a couple of verses uh, back into chapter uh, Romans chapter 3 and you look at chapter 3 and verse 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's it. We've all come short. Now go over to chapter 6. And the end of chapter 6, verse 23. So in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. So if I'm a sinner, what I deserve is to what? die to die an eternal death and a, a physical death and a spiritual death the wage of sin if it said the wage of sin is to join the baptist church then joining the baptist church would get you forgiveness but it didn't say that if it said the wage of sin is being sprinkled immersed poured upon and calling it baptism that's not the wage of sin somebody has to die 
and shed their blood for your sin. That's the only way to get your sin paid for. Any other road is a lie because Christ died for our sins. And uh, I can't forgive you. I mean, if you come run your car through my petunias, I can forgive you, but I wouldn't. But, all right, look over to the uh, middle of your Bible, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Romans was written some years after Jesus died and was raised from the dead. Isaiah, written hundreds of years prior to Christ's birth. And you want to find Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And, and in this chapter, there's, there's a lot of prophecy in Isaiah. And, and, and just so you understand, Isaiah's back here um, about the time of the fall of Jerusalem, which is... Uh, about 600 years before Jesus was born, 586, somewhere in there. It wasn't a day, it was a time period. And so 600 years or so, Isaiah's preaching to, uh, to Israel about how to, get, how to not be destroyed, and they weren't listening. But in the midst of his preaching, he is speaking prophetically 600 years into the future about Jesus, and sometimes 2,000 years into the future to his second coming, but so we're, we're in the middle of his prophecies, but he's talking now about Jesus. And so look at chapter 53, and I'm just going to pick out a verse or two, but look at verse 4, Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. I was witnessing to a Jewish lady many years ago and, and uh, she didn't want to see my Bible but she would look at her Bible. We had her, her Hebrew Bible which was in English but the Hebrew Bible doesn't have the New Testament. But anyway, and it's the order is a little mixed up but you can find it if you look a little bit. And we were talking about um, our different beliefs. And I said, let me just show you. And one of the places we turned was Isaiah 53. And that verse we just read, I read with her. And I said, let me ask you in verse five, do you know anybody who ever claimed to be wounded for our transgressions? Do you know anyone who was bruised for our iniquities? Do you know anybody who with his stripes, we are healed? Go down to verse 10. I went down, I went through all these verses with her, but I'll just summarize it in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Then shall, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. I asked, do you know anybody, anyone in the whole history of the world who ever claimed that their death was an offering for the sins of all mankind? And it's so funny. She looked at me and she said, well, Jesus, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yes, ma'am. It was, he's the only one. And it's in your Old Testament. She didn't want to see Jesus in the New Testament, so we just showed her Jesus in the Old Testament. But what we're looking at here prophetically is one of the most amazing things. Look at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And if we can just stop for a minute, it's hard for us to believe this, but there are times our suffering is necessary to help somebody else. None of us like that. But the freedom we have, we want to stay, say in a political sense, our freedom would be as a result of people who were willing to put on a uniform and suffer or risk suffering for our freedom's sake. Um, you young people, whatever kind of a home you're in, if, the, if a mom or dad or a grandpa or grandma or somebody went to work and paid the bills to, and brought money home to provide for your needs, Somebody suffered for your sake. Only in this sake, it's an eternal case. Look at verse 11. Speaking of God in verse 11, we're in Isaiah 53, verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. So God, 2,000 years ago, is looking at Jesus dying on the cross. And he sees Christ's death and his burial and his resurrection. And God says... I'm satisfied with that. 
Well, what's he satisfied? Well, he's satisfied because you and I up here 2,000 years later are a bunch of rotten old sinners. And, and we owe God. We are debtors. We've offended a holy God. We have grieved the righteousness of God. We have shamed the, the principles and the morals and the ethics of the God who gave us the Bible. And in our weakness and in our sinfulness, we, we, are, we owe a debt to God. And God says, I see what Jesus did, and that satisfies me on your behalf. And if we were to go back just a little bit, none of us want this. But there's two things we're talking about this morning. Number one is your salvation. And that has to do with entirely with what Jesus did. But when it comes to everything else in life, somebody has to die to help other people. Today, quite a few of our young people are preaching across the world, South America and across the South Pacific and over in Southeast Asia and across different states and cities in America. We have young people who said, I'll die to being with grandpa and grandma every Christmas and Thanksgiving so that somebody in Belize or Thailand or the Philippines or somewhere else could hear the gospel. Amen. They died. They, 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 they died to some things. There are people who said, I will die to a more lucrative career and live on a more meager income so that I could be doing whatever it is in the ministry in America or somewhere else. And they're saying, I'm willing to sacrifice maybe some economic returns so that I might help somebody else. See, that's Christ-likeness. We, we have this crazy idea, I want all the blessings, but I don't want anybody to have to pay for it. Let me tell you something, you weren't born without somebody paying for it. There, there's a mom, and in some cases a dad, who went through a lot. You know, I, I, I sat in the waiting room saying, come on. No, I didn't. There's a mom who went through a lot. You, you and I, were, we didn't breathe our first breath before somebody hurt so we could live. And everything, I mean, how many times has, did you spit up on your mom? Burp them away from you so they don't spit up on you. But anyway, how many times did somebody get up in the middle of the night because you were sick or you were scared? And how many times did your parents come up with money so you could go to this or do that or wear this or have a, whatever it is you wanted? And for your and my entire life growing up, somebody died every day. By the way, kids, you ought to be thankful for that. Adults, we ought to be thankful for that. Um, I don't think we quit owing our parents. And so somebody died of, uh, from their the, the, the lack of sleep. They didn't die, but they died to sleep. Uh, somebody, the, the free time they could have spent, the hobbies they could have had. You know, at some point, I just say a word to you that are raising children. If, you're, if you have a spouse and children and a job and you're doing anything at all in church, you don't have time for a hobby. There, it is just too hard to raise kids to be involved in these massive time, time vacuums. And I don't, think, I don't think hobbies and things are wrong, but I'll tell you what, when I had, I had my children at home and my kids were four kids were stretched out 14 years, and which was, you know, some of you that put them all one back to back, Come on, folks, that's, that's a lot of work. But anyway, whatever works. Um, but we had a, our oldest was 14 when our youngest was born. And um, that's full time. I had one goal, my marriage and my children. That's two goals. But my home was my goal. I had one goal, my family. And, of course, in that, I had to find a way to pay bills. And in that, I had to find a way to train these children and, and teach them to work and teach them to, to take care of their, their own needs. And, and uh, somehow, look, I didn't, there's a lot of things I could have done. I didn't, I just didn't have time to go play. Not have my kids turn out. Right? Look, I want my kids to grow up and be rich and take care of me when I'm old. <laughs> I've succeeded in my kids growing up. <laughs> the getting rich part <laughs> is very unlikely to happen. 
in our lives. Train them to serve God, all right? So if you look at verse 10, back to this matter of salvation, we're in Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his what? He shall see his what? Seed and be satisfied. So now here's what's going on. You know what the word seed means in the Bible. It's children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren. And so back here 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross and God looks at Jesus. He sees his death. He sees his burial. He sees his resurrection. And God says, I see your seed. Isn't that interesting? He used the word born again. You're born again of a seed physically as well as spiritually in Peter he says being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever so we are born again we're born into the family we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we are born again and because of the seed of God we are born and then we tell somebody and they tell somebody and the gospel message is passed down from generation to generation. And so clear back here, the Lord looks at Jesus and he sees Jesus's seed and is satisfied. And I love the fact that God can be satisfied. Now let me just stop for a minute. Some of you feel like you couldn't make anybody happy. You put your faith in Christ, you made God happy. See, I've kind of made a mess of life. Put your faith in Jesus Christ, and God will be happy with you. There's nobody in this room that's achieved such a state of living that God says, wow, they are awesome. Look at them, Gabriel and Michael. Look at them, Jesus. I mean, there's Pat and Rachel McDowell. There ain't nobody as good as them, said God never. <laughs> Now, that might be the fact among us, but it's not a fact in heaven. And, and you know, the devil's going to come along to some of you and discourage you. You know why your kids got this problem? You know why you have this marriage problem? Because you're such a loser and God doesn't love you and you're, you've messed up so much. Why would God care about you? Let me tell you why God cares about me. Because of Calvary. Because God sees what Jesus did and he looks at Christ's seed and he's satisfied. When I die, I will die a sinner. And when I step into heaven, I will step into heaven clothed in Christ's righteousness. And God is satisfied. Don't you let the devil get you to sit around so filled with dismay and discouragement that you think he didn't care about you and you think you've made so many mistakes that God, well, how could God ever use me or love me? He, he loves you because of Calvary. That's why he loves you. He loves you because you had enough sense to look to the cross and say, I want it. I want him and I want what he did for me and I want it. And God says, you want my son? Hey, welcome to the family. I'm happy with you. Now, would God like you to represent him well? Yes. He'd love, but, but you know what? We're going to fumble and stumble at that. You know, if we were just to have true confessions, how many of you, you, you were a little upset with your spouse this week? There would be a, maybe two hands up out of this group. <laughs> you say, what about that? Here I am, and here perfect Pat McDowell got a little flustered with Rachel because she didn't put enough butter on his wheat toast. And, and how did he know? Man, I know. The Spirit of God. <laughs> God looks at Pat's frustration with his perfect wife, and he sees it paid for on Calvary. And so that sin of being frustrated with a perfect woman, which all of us married, that sin that you committed, God saw it paid for when Jesus breathed his last breath. And so since Pat's sin was already paid for, 
Are we are you with me on this? Since Pat's sin was paid for in Calvary and God saw that Pat was going to put his faith in Christ and saw that Pat and Rachel, though they were perfect in the eyes of people, that they were needing to be forgiven, all of their sin was paid for in Calvary. And then when they put their faith in Jesus Christ, they were born into the family, his seed, they became his seed and God sees what Jesus did and he sees his seed and he says, wow, perfect children. And that's why it's the biggest lie you ever heard to have some preacher or reverend or rabbi or whoever tell you how good you have to be to get to heaven. That's a lie. Because you couldn't be good enough to get to heaven. I couldn't be good enough to heaven. I couldn't punish myself enough to pay for my own sins. I couldn't flog myself. And you hear these, some of these third world countries where people at Easter time will crucify themselves and try and, and punish themselves to atone for their sin. My blood is so sinful, I could shed every drop of my blood and it would yet to pay my sin debt. It takes perfect blood my sin debt and so God says I'll see the travail of his soul not the travail of your soul over in Ezekiel God says uh, you think I have pleasure in the death of the wicked I have no no pleasure that the wicked should die I want the wicked saved I've had, I've had on a couple occasions people picking on me a little bit kind of accusing me because I was good to people who were bad gasp that puts me with Jesus He's awful good to sinners. I'm glad I've got a savior who loved a sinner. And so God sees the travail of his soul and he's satisfied. He shall see his seed and be satisfied. Let's just look one more real quick. And we've got to stop here. Um, verse, uh, look at verse 12. Therefore, will I divide a portion with the divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because look at this he hath poured out his soul unto death jesus poured out his soul unto death he was numbered with the transgressors remember he was he was on the cross between two thieves and murderers he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors now there's a whole lot more verses in here we can look at on the, this whole subject but let's go back to where we started in Romans chapter 4 to him that worketh not all right you got the you can picture Benny up here with his his religion no to him that worketh we started Benny and his religious deeds to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt a debtor that means I don't care how religious we are, how good we are, how well we treat each other. At the end of our life, we will be debtors to a holy God. Can't, I can't get out of being a debtor because somebody's got to die to keep me from being a debtor. But to him that worketh not, but what's that next word? Believeth, if you're not there, Romans 4, 5, or 6 in there, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. You know what Jesus did over in Isaiah 53? Jesus justified the ungodly. Jesus said, I'll take that. I'll pay for that. I will cover you. You owe it, but I'll pay it. My wife and I were at Richie's Diner the other day. Somebody gave us a gift card. And we try to always remember who, we don't always do it, but we try to remember who gave us gift cards. And when we eat, we say, thank you, Lord, for this person who did, who uh, gave us this whatever and uh, who bought me my barbecued ribs or whatever it was. You know what Jesus did on the cross? He bought your salvation. He paid for it. And just in in closing let's understand this when someone comes along and tells you yes you're saved but if you don't live right then you're not saved 
Now we're getting into theology. If you're newer, just put a period where I've stopped and just hang on for a minute. I'm born here in, in May 1957. I know you're shocked. May of 1957. I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. In 1975, I get saved. And God justified me, right? To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? Righteousness, Romans 5, 5, Romans 4, 5. So there in August of 1975, when I put my faith I believed the gospel and put my faith in Christ. My faith was counted for righteousness, right? Right? Okay, all good. We good with that? So I am now righteous, right? Am I righteous? Yes or no? Yes, by the blood of Christ, not my own goodness. So now. 50 years later, we're in 2023, and I pull out in the street, and someone nearly hits me, and I speak in tongues, Yamaha Kawasuki says, <laughs> and I say a few choice words I learned from Don House, and, <laughs> and um, I'm a sinner. Oh, I sinned. Wait a minute. Am I a sinner or am I righteous? My vertical? I am righteous before God. Now the guy who I explained his driving errors to, he thinks I'm a sinner. You know why God thinks I'm righteous? Because he shall see the travail of his soul, Christ on the cross, and God says, I'll see your seed, and I am satisfied. And with his pouring out of his soul, he will justify many, these. So I put my faith in Christ here. But you know what happened? I'm still a sinner. Not a bad sinner. <laughs> I'm a sinner, right? And the devil's going to come along to you, and you're right here. And, and you lost a marriage, lost a business. You made some foolish decisions. And the devil comes and says, you don't belong in church because you're bad. Not in the eyes of God, you're not. In the eyes of God, you're justified. The devil come along to one of you teenagers and say, Oh, you did this and this. You don't, they don't want you back at that church. Who do you think these, the rest of the group is? You think everybody sitting around you is holy? Let me just say this. We took the people over 40 and under 40. The over 40s have got just as many sins as the under 40. Maybe more because we've had more time. We've had some time to really invest in this thing of being a sinner. <laughs> and I'm not making a mockery of sin. But look, in, in 65 years of living, I've had a lot of chances to offend a holy God. And so theologically, let's understand my sin down here in 2023 was paid for when Christ justified me. He shall see the travail of his soul and God is satisfied. And at what moment in time Romans 4 took place and I said I am not going to work to be saved I am going to believe and put my faith, I will believe what I hear and put my faith in what Christ did. And God says that to him that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. This idea that if you're not perfect, you're not going to heaven. Let me tell you something, that's a stupid idea. Because none of us are perfect. You see, the, the crowd that, and I'm not picking on, on, on you or anybody else, just in the dumb theology. The person who comes along and says, well, you know, if you sinned, you're probably not really saved. Turn it right around and say, did you sin today? How about yesterday? How about the day before? 
or the day before. Well, well, yeah, that's different. It's not a bad sin. Show me any verse in the Bible that says good and bad sin. That mortal and venial thing, you got that from El Papa. <laughs> Calls himself father and dresses like mother. I apologize if that offends you. But I get issues with a guy who, who says you have to be good enough to get to heaven when he needs to get saved. We're all sinners. We've already looked at There's none righteous. No, not one. So understand this. When somebody comes along and tells you, if you sin, you're probably not saved. I did. I will. And so will you. Now, let's not forget, at least three times I can think of off the top of my head, the Bible talks about God chastening his children. If you're saved and you get off doing stupid things, sinful things, God will whip the fire out of you. Say, so you think you can just go off and be a sinner and, and God not deal with it? Oh, no, he'll deal with it. But he's, that's on earth. But vertical, God sees you the moment you put your faith in Christ. He sees you as righteous. And that's, I tell you, that's good news. The word gospel means good news. You know what the good news is? An old sinner can be saved. Say, how good do you have to be? Not any good at all. Just have to believe Say, so, well, that seems pretty easy. Ask how the nail prints were easy. There was nothing easy about your salvation. The blood that was shed to pay for my sin was the most painful, miserable hours any human ever lived. My salvation was not easy. I just got a gift that cost someone else dearly and don't get acting like and don't let anyone convince you that some self-righteous religious person somehow achieves some higher level because the best Christian you know is a sinner and we're saved by grace and as a Christian my Christian life I want to help people. I want to teach the word of God. I want to raise my children to love God. I want to, I want to be respectful and honoring and all those things. But those things can't get me to heaven. Only Jesus, what he did on Calvary. That is what makes me righteous. Now, I just want to tell people how good he is because he's awfully good. Let's pray. Father, help us today to grasp these things. They're, they're not human. These things don't make sense to mankind we, we think everything should be equally covered and paid for. We don't understand the eternal. And, and if there's some here this morning who don't understand, I pray you'd help them. And we looked at the scriptures, and there's, there's lots more just like it. We need your help. And, Lord, there's some today who would feel like their, maybe their road is harder than others. But we don't know, but maybe their suffering is that another would live. Maybe there's someone here this morning who feels like others have had an easier path and, and yet you're letting them travel a hard path, but they're going to be a huge help to somebody one day. We ask your help that they would endure. For the person here today who might not be saved, help them to understand that Jesus saves sinners. Simple as that. Not a church, not a religion, but Jesus. Not being good, but faith and believing and for those of us who've been saved for years, may we represent you well, but help us not get off on goofy doctrines that would lead us astray. Help us to be clean and straight with our Bible. May we tell others of it. May we preach it. May we teach it to our classes and to our children in the jails and the rest homes today. Help us, Lord, to get the truth simply and clearly to your people. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for just a moment with our heads bowed. Would you take a moment? We just we call it in.